Welcome back to Exponential 201. This is module three and it's lesson one and the whole title of this is change management. Now, there's a lot of science behind when a company or a corporation wants to change something, what's the best way to get that change to stick? It's really the science of change management. Lots of programs are started that never catch on, that people don't buy into, that people don't gravitate towards. It might make all the logical sense in the world. It might make all the uh, you know, logistical sense in the world. It might be a lot easier that way, but people just don't do it. People are creatures of habit. They don't like change, even if they've been convinced that change ought to happen. Um, they don't like it. And so uh, we have great reasons you know, logical reasons for change. All the data we've given you, the future, the trends, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but implementing change management in your church can be a very difficult thing. So we want to teach you some wise steps to take so that there's maximum opportunity to, for buy-in. Now, uh, these next several sessions, there might be uh, ones you want to go over again and again, maybe every few months to go back through them again. I find myself what I'm about to do is review a few books with you, okay, that are some of the best change management books that I have found and principles that I have found. And I find myself going back to them again and again and again because there's so many great principles. And so this lesson is called Heart, The Heart of Change. It's really based on uh, the content of a guy named John Cotter, who was one of my professors at Harvard Business School when I was there taking an owners and presidents uh, series of classes um, for owners and presidents of companies. I was only there one there that was a leader of a ministry and they were wondering what am I doing there but I met Dr. Cotter got to know him went to his house and um, he actually came to one of our events and analyzed it for us and so the heart of change is this is when you want people to change you can't just say here's the data here's the information and here's the plan uh, here's the one quote go after the emotions with concrete almost smellable evidence not just abstractions um, by the rational mind so we, we want to go after their heart and get them emotionally engaged. So here's John Cotter. Um, he's written a lot of books, but these are some of his more famous ones. Leading Change is um, kind of his seminal, was one of his very first books, and sold millions and millions of, of copies of these. And basically what he did is went to a bunch of companies and looked at ones that were very successful at implementing change and... Um, what then did they do that were all similar? And so then he outlines that those in the book, and that's where we're going to through. You can see he signed my book here. Um, and then he wrote a follow-up book to that called Heart of Change, which uh, what he did is he put an eight kind of step uh, process together for change management. We're going to go through that here. But then he uh, mimicked that and shadowed that with um, Heart of Change. Like how do you get to the core emotional center so that people want to change? And so... Um, uh, anyways, it's hard to change. So we're going to go through it. And how does it apply to your church here? And again, you might want to go through some of these again and again with the same group or with other people because <clears throat> you guys get it, right? I've, you're, you've got, you're taking the deep dive. You're going through these classes. But what about the other subgroups? The men's group, the women's group, um, the, the board of the church, the elders of the church, other subgroups within the church, the congregation as a whole, um, the ushers, the greeters. And so we don't want to do this by saying, hey, we've got an announcement for you. We want to be really wise about how we introduce change, taking baby steps. That's why, remember we talked about making the plan is one thing, but implementing the plan is another. Part of the implementation of the plan is using some wise um, change management tools. So here we go. Um, wise leaders stimulate a desire for change and then they reinforce with reasons okay they don't just say we're going to change first they get attention there's kind of three step get attention stimulate desire reinforce with re reasons okay so uh, we get their attention um, when we're getting ready to kind of introduce something we're going to get their attention with some reason and then you stimulate the desire one really big thing i'm going to talk about it several times here in the next few sessions is this thing called confirmation bias. Because if you start off with reasons and with logic, even with data, most times what that will do is it will entrench people. If they have confirmation bias, it'll confirm what they already believe because they definitely, most people don't want to change. So it'll actually make them more entrenched against the idea of change. 
when one leads with logic and try to rally the need for a radical shift of direction without reaching the emotional dimension of, of an argument, you get confirmation bias. Like it just confirms my bias against you. Okay. And so, uh, some of the data shows a significant body of psychological research shows that it even entrenches them, making it, making them more vi uh, vi vehemently against your ideas of changing. Right. And so we got to be careful of that. If we go right after the data, even though we think the data makes all the sense in the world, we got to go after their heart. So, these are Dr. Cotter's eight steps for implementing change. I'll go through them real quick and then we'll go through them in detail. Number one is increased urgency. That's getting their attention. Two is building a guiding team. That's you guys around the table. Three, that's getting the vision right. Four is communicate for buy-in. Five is empower action. Six is create short-term wins. Seven is don't let up. And eight is make change stick. So this is the process that the most successful companies implementing change use. So number one, increase urgency. So we want to help them have a desire to change. If you can't stimulate the desire, some say you, you lose. If you cannot stimulate desire for change and you do that by creating urgency. In fact, Dr. Carter wrote a whole book called urgency quickly stimulating desire for a different state of affairs is the most important. Everybody say the most important part of communication. Without it, leadership communication goes nowhere. Stimulating desire for a different state of affairs. And so we can't underestimate how important that is. Every time, anytime you're communicating anything about you want something different, pull this little, you, eight, these eight steps are like little um, tools that you pull out of your tool belt and use it, okay? So you're increasing urgency. You can do that by stories. You can do that with, you know, what's happening in your church. And it's important not to start with vision. A lot of people go, let me share the new vision. You want to get motivation to want to listen to the vision before they even hear the vision, okay? Um, so that they've kind of already like, oh my gosh, we've got to do something. What can we do? Well, we've been thinking about this for a matter of months. And this is what me and the team have come up with. And uh, this, this is the vision. But first, you're increasing the urgency, right? You're, you're kind of letting it go out, get out there. Some of the ways you can do that is um, for your local church is, you know, interview local teens. Just random men on the street. Uh, what do you think about God? Who do you think Jesus is? Uh, what about Christians? What do you think of Christians? On the scale of 1 to 10, how close do you think you are to God? If someone invited you to church, would you be willing to go? And so you start rolling in some of these videos, not to church service yet, but like um, maybe you're going to meet with a board of elders or the board of directors for the church or uh, some other subgroup. And you, by them listening to other people's story, it creates urgency. Like, oh my gosh, there's like five out of ten don't even know who Jesus is, whatever. Um, um, and so um, you might talk to different age groups other I'm talking about video uh, vid, uh, interviews with them just men on the street it doesn't have to be real professional and you know 14 year olds how open are you to God on a scale of 1 to 10 15 year olds how open are you 13 year olds how open are you and so what you're doing is you're creating a narrative a story that you want people to understand you're not just saying we need to reach them you're letting them with their own mouth say we need to be reached um, you could also tell uh, stories We'll talk about narrative intelligence in coming lessons, but stories are a great way to do this. Even when you're communicating data, um, uh, a tragic story, either live via video of youth in your town who've been trafficked sexually or experienced unwanted pregnancy, been victims of divorce. Uh, or um, if you're going to talk about, do you know how many young people, their parents are getting divorced in our town? Don't start with that. Start with one story of one young person who's totally broken with divorce and then go, and you know that how often that happens right here in our town or in our city, that kind of thing. Um, and so I love this phrase, forget trying to persuade them, set their pants on fire. So that's what we want to do. So number two is building the guiding team. And that's what you guys are. And uh, we're going to get even more specific, the task force, the Project 13 task force. But the guiding team is not just official members. It's more like the people who get it, who believe in it, who understand it. And it needs to start with you guys, but expand beyond you all. Okay. So and uh, I would encourage you to, uh, instead of telling people, you should care, you should care, you ought to care, is employ the power of asking what if. So for example, what if? 
There's 10,000 13 year olds in our town. What if the Lord wanted us to reach 5,000 of them? How would we do that? Just what if, if it was the Lord's idea. So the idea of the what if is it, it allows people to buy in. Like if it was really the Lord's idea, I know there's a lot of debate over and, and, and leading a ministry myself for many, many, like for three decades, there's a lot of, did God tell you that? Or, you know, if it's God, if God told you that it's going to happen no matter what we do. And there's a lot of kind of debate over that. And um, uh, you almost feel like if God told you, then we can't fail. But, but if you say, what if? What if the Lord's will is for us to really do this? What would we have to do to be prepared for that? What would we have to be pre- to do to, to be prepared to respond to that? And it gets them using their imagination to buy into it. Okay, so we're building this guiding team here. Um, I encourage you, as you're looking for more people to be a part of this, you need real like muscle and help and time. Don't aff- aff- be afraid to approach busy people. Busy people are busy for a reason. They get stuff done and people know it. That's why they're busy. Don't wait for them to be unbusy. All right. Busy people, when they hear something that grabs their heart, they'll do it. And so be careful about trying to get people that aren't doing anything because many times they come in and they want to run everything because they have nothing else to do. That's all they think about. Trust me. I know from experience. Okay. Number three is getting the vision right. And so, uh, it's important for the vision to be simple, clear, and compelling to be articulated in a minute or less. I would encourage you to use some of the visioning materials. Uh, this is what uh, uh, an exponential church does. This is how we do it by, by focusing on reaching and discipling those most likely to come to Christ. We will create a, a pipeline of passionate young adults that are passionate for Christ and uh, their multipliers and use some of that verbiage that we've shared with you before, add it to some of the maybe vision statement you have for the church for this year and um, just make sure that it's real, it's real clear and it's succinct. I would encourage you also to think about this. When you begin to share vision with people, they want to know three things. What are we doing? That's the vision. Why are we doing it? And what's at stake if we don't? That creates urgency. And, there, and the, big, the biggest question of that is, what is my place? So in each group, as you introduce this slowly, you're not going to introduce it all at once. You guys are getting it. You guys are going to shape the vision and shape the plan. Then you're going to start introducing it to this group and to that group. They're all going to want to know, well, how does the men's group, men's ministry fit into this? And the women's ministry, and the children's ministry, and then this ministry, and that ministry. How does the elder board fit into this? And they want to know, what is my place? You, once you introduce it to the adults in the church, which we'll talk you through that, um, they're asking that same question. What is my place in this? How can I be a part of this? Um, not feeling obligated, but more feeling empowered and excited. Um, number four in the stages of, of change is communicate for buy-in. Um, like, uh, what is my place in this vision? Where do I fit? It kind of it kind of builds on that very last question I just mentioned. So you want them to to buy into it. You don't want them just to hear it. You want them to go, okay, I get it. Okay, what can I do to be a part of it? All right. And so um, intentional communication. When asked how to fit in questions about finding one's place, um, ways not to respond. It's not just data transfer. Because of this reason, because of this reason, da 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 da. da. It's it, you still have to remember, even though you're thinking logically, this is where we need people to help. You're trying to go after their heart. Ways to respond: say something that addresses their anxiety. Is our whole church going to change? No, it's not. It's just we're going to add this other track. We're going to add this thing. Say something that uh, accepts their anger. You know, um, and you know they might be mad about some things that are going to be a little bit different. Maybe the music will be a little bit different than you're used to. Not all of it, but. Would it be worth it if we could see this many more people go to heaven? Say something that gut level communicates to evoke their faith in the vision. That like that goes beyond logic. Like we care about these young people. Well, don't we care about Susie, that story I just told you? And be prepared for questions because they're going to have them. So also using visual images. Here you see one from Africa. Um, it moves people. You can many times, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. You can, you can move them with a photo, with a video. Uh, with something that communicates on a on a bigger level so um the next one is empower action that is uh you want to you want to say listen we need people to do this and to do this and do this and you're going to be able to take some action and we want you to be able to do that um dismantling barriers in people's minds keep them from believing in the vision and embolden them to take action so you might think well i'm too busy for this or i can't really do this but 
as we talk about how to introduce this to the whole congregation, you can get them involved at different levels. They can just pray for young people. They can they can commit to pick some young people up and bring them to, to the uh, epic event. Um, they, they can they can come and stay and usher and help that way. And so they don't have to do everything. They can just, just do one little thing, even if it's just praying, okay? So empowering action. A simple organizational chart helps them to see, you know, where do I fit in all of this? We have, the, as you will see, we're going to have five different members of the task force, the Project 13 task force, and everybody that's helping will be a part of one of those five um, ta task force members teams, right? And so uh, you'll be able to, to show them where they fit in that, okay? And uh, create short-term wins. Now, we want to do this with you, and we're, we're, you'll, as you see, as we roll this out, um, to, to, these next several weeks as you're seeing the whole plan, part of the idea is um, by the time we announce, we, we, there's four phases. There's phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Phase one is the quiet phase. You'll learn the details of that. Phase two is the public phase. That's where we announce to the church, announce to more people. And then within a few weeks, we have the big epic event. And then the week after that, we have this big win. So they're, they're going to be thinking, oh my gosh, they've been doing this. We just heard about this, and now we got this huge win. Well, they didn't realize you're, you can tell them later that you had this quiet phase, you were doing all this, but they're going to feel this whole sense of, look what we've already done. And you come back the week after the epic event, and you show videos, and you have testimonies of people who came to Christ, and they feel like, oh my gosh, the wind is at our back, and we've already got the small group leaders trained, and they're already meeting in small groups. And so um, you've got these short-term wins. You've got you know the training and, and it builds momentum in people's heart, it builds validity for vision, and encourages others to jump on board of the vision. Don't worry if you don't get everybody jumping on the vision right away. It's okay. You know, people are hesitant of change. So when you announce to the congregation and you only have like 10% sign up to pray for people and 5% say, hey, we'll help pick up 13 year olds to come, it's okay. Um, if, you don't, if you don't get 93% wanting to pray, it's, it's okay. You might get a lot more than, than 10%, but um, it's, it's okay. And but as they see an early win, they'll they'll pick up momentum. So creating short-term wins in the midst of that focus is the key. Remember, the church is exponential, is focused on reaching and discipling. So you just keep your focus. Your strategy is that focus. Um, you're not doing a million different things, not doing hundreds of different programs. You're doing this. This is what the second track is all about. Um, uh, the seventh uh, step here is don't let up. You got to keep going even when it doesn't feel fun anymore or n doesn't feel new anymore. You and you got to inspire people to keep going. These are people at all levels. These are your small group leaders, connect group leaders. These are, you know, staff members, pastors, leaders of departments. You got to keep them motivated. Keep the vision in front of them with stories, with heartfelt change stories, things that are happening. Realize there's got to be like a fountain of this coming out all the time. You don't let up. Remind people of the few victories, that a few victories don't mean that the whole vision's accomplished yet. We've just started here, right? And uh, you get started on planning on the second epic event and that kind of thing. And then you're, uh, the last thing is you're making it stick. That is, just because you've gone through one cycle, that is a whole year of uh, Project 13 and, and you're becoming an exponential church, really it takes three, four, five years for the whole machine to be built, right? Because you've got to have leaders and then leaders of leaders and then leaders of leaders. And then by then, by the third or fourth year, you start seeing the exponential payoff where your church might actually be double in size by then. And I'm not I'm not kidding, but you got to lean into that and anticipate that people will go, hey, we've been doing this program. Is it time for another one? No, we're going to stick with this for the next three to five years and watch how it grows and grows and grows. Change can be fragile because it can feel like, wow, that was easy. Well, it's easy to have a short-term win. It's harder to have a long-term win. So we're going to make it kind of the new norm. Even the children of Israel got delivered from slavery and they wanted to go back. And you might have people after a few months, six months, four months, we want to go back. This is too much time. This is too much energy. It will get easier. It takes way more effort the first few months. That's why you guys around this table are so imperative. It takes way more effort at the beginning to get things going. And after a while, it'll become self-propelled and you'll see what I'm talking about, right? So, um, if, if those guys wanted to go back after they saw all the miracles and the plagues, imagine people in your church may want to go back to how things used to be. After a while, 
if you keep it going, you make it stick, you'll have a new culture emerge. And the, the new track and the new culture will take over the old and the, and the old track, those guys will be cheerleaders, they'll be so excited, they'll see all this energy, but they don't feel like they you know, need to drive the whole thing because you've got this whole new culture that's emerged. So that's leading change and the heart of change um, from, from Dr. Cotter, some of the, the most important change management tools you're going to need uh, right now. We've got a couple more lessons on change management, but here's some questions for you to think about to discuss once this video is over. What youth issues or stories could be used to create urgency in our church? Like, what are, what are we doing? What, what are we doing about it? What's the vision? Um, why are we doing this? And what's at stake if we don't do it? Remember the series of questions? And um, finally, what's my place in this for each type of church member? So talk through those questions because you're going to have to talk about them again and again and again and again because change management is going to be a regular topic of conversation for you all as you begin to roll this out. Thank you.